Hello and welcome to another edition of My Tech U, where we our monthly discussion today is going to focus on uh, hackers. Actually, we want to focus on stopping hackers, not not on the positive aspects of hackers. But uh, today we are uh, fortunate to have one of our security partners, uh, FR Secure, join us and uh, enlighten us and educate us on the things that we should all be uh, more aware of with regard to protecting and securing our our information, our customers' information, our corporate confidential information, um, patents, things like that that, that uh, you may be storing on your networks. Um, hackers are everywhere. And uh, one of the things that uh, our customers, I always like to communicate to our customers when they ask us about security is that you know, MyTech is very much a security generalist. We understand security. We implement security. We definitely uh, work through security profiles with firewalls and patches and updates and things like that. And where FR Secure comes into play is they're more security specialists. So I'll let Brian elaborate on that. But um, just to kind of create a delineation between our two organizations and how we work together, uh, it's when there's a deeper dive, uh, you'll see Brian will tell you about all the different aspects of the, that they get into. So I'm, I'm excited to hear the pr presentation. I've seen some of the content, and it looks, uh, it looks great. So uh, be ready for the next 45 minutes of some uh, great content from Brian. So Brian, please take it away. Hi there, everybody. Um, I, I know we're kind of on, uh, I think we muted here, but if you're able to locate the, uh, the, the chat window for the presentation, um, I'm just kind of curious to get a feel for, for uh, as far as uh, information security and, and hackers and, and uh, you know, networks and all that kind of stuff uh, can be fun and interesting. If you think it can be halfway decent, yeah, fun and interesting, could you, could you uh, maybe pop like a little smiley face or I guess in the to send that so that we all can see it, but I'd just like to know if, if we've got some fans of network and, and information security here. Ooh, it's kind of, kind of. Either people can't find it or, <laughs> no, we, no, no. We got a couple people, uh, Brian. We've got a couple people with Brian that are responding on the uh, on on the uh, uh, the question uh, window. So we're good. Yeah, we're getting we're getting some smiley faces come through. So okay, and then and then on the flip side, are there, there are folks who would rather you know, just you'd, you'd rather bleach your eyes and, and just get this get this kind of uh, subject matter over with. You can also say hello and maybe put a smiley face up. You can tell me if we've got some people who would would rather be doing anything but talk about this stuff. <laughs> Hopefully, those people aren't on the call. You know. <laughs> good. Okay. All right. Good. Well, uh, I'll just uh, again my oh let's see oops a second said that it shared. My Said screen sharing is paused. Hold on a second. You still able to see? Yeah, I see everything, bro. See everything, fine? Okay. Um, so I'll just do uh, some introductions, just a short blurb on FR Secure and and myself, and then we'll uh, we'll get talking about hackers a little bit more, uh, who who they are and, and what they want, and then we'll we'll dig um, into more of the the meat of the matter, which is is why employees are just as big of a risk to your organization as hackers are, as as unfortunate news as that may seem. Um, so FR Secure, we, we're an information security consulting company, and that's that's it. That's what we do. So we, we don't sell products. We don't have other services. Um, we just we just live and breathe information security. And uh, it was established in, in 2008 by people who, again, really just just have this in, in their blood. We find it kind of exciting and fun, and and I hope uh, you know, we can have a good discussion here, and you you will also find it uh, interesting and maybe even a little bit fun. Um, we help small to medium sized organizations solve their information security challenges. We do a ton of work with with banks and and uh, uh, you know medical organizations and and uh, law firms, but really information security is for any business and every business. Um, the, uh, the 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 bottom line is we get. We get paid to tell people the truth. Oh, you know what? Let me just uh, check one thing here because it looks like I've advanced a slide, um, but people are not seeing. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it. There. Sorry, okay, now it's showing. There we go. You seeing that one now? Seeing Jack Nicholson? Yep. No, okay. we're good. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. So, uh, yeah. Bottom line, we're we're paid to tell people the truth. That's what we're gonna gonna talk about today. Um, my name is Brian Johnson. We have probably the most you know, boring vanilla ice cream Minnesota name you could hope for, but I, I do fortunately share it with some some cool other Brian Johnsons, uh, such as the the one from uh, ACDC. 
uh, as well as Anthony Michael Hall's character in Breakfast Club. If anybody's a Breakfast Club fan out there, I'm probably dating myself. Um, but uh, I come from a, um, a very uh, strong network engineering and architecture and security. Uh, and also uh, on the side, I have a very, very minuscule um, week career that I'm trying to do. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the, the 1996 uh, Super Smash holiday film Jingle All the Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, but you have, and if you look really closely, um, there's a scene in there with Christmas carolers in it, and, and I'm the guy with the ridiculous top hat on. And uh, I also just called out that my, uh, my wife Amy, she was not my wife at the time, I was in high school, let's just make that, let's just make that clear. But, uh, uh, we were uh, we were Christmas carolers in there, so we got Arnold and hang out, and we just wait patiently for them to make a sequel, um, so that we can go uh, on into that portion of our careers. But for now, I'm 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 here to talk about talk about security. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about hackers. Um, here's a couple of definitions from Wikipedia: Is that a hacker is an enthusiastic and skillful computer programmer or user, or a person who is to gain unauthorized to data. That's probably, that second definition is, is, is the one we deal with most often and is maybe how you, you visualize the people that might be trying to get into your network. But they, they, they come you know, from, from all walks of life, all political, religious backgrounds. Um, but as far as the, the hacker category itself, it really gets broken down kind of into three flavors, if you will. There's a, a black hat hacker. And typically, these are the folks that are, are thought of as hacking for harm. So they're trying to break into systems and exploit them for their financial gain or, or other reasons. Uh, so, so they're the ones looking to, to write viruses and, and send you uh, phishing emails that look like they come from your bank but will actually do, you know, uh, cause you loss of data if you click on them. Um, also, another kind of public uh, popular activity with hackers is to deface popular websites. And, you know, getting religious and political messages on them instead of uh, the intended website content. On the on the flip side of that, there's white hat hackers, and the folks that, that we typically think of as, as hacking to help or or uh, also considered an ethical hacker. So they're using their skills and their training to find problems with systems and software, but then they also work with those systems and software vendors to try to create patches and fixes so that they can stay ahead of the black hat hackers. Um, many of them are, are just hobbyists. Um, I know I kind of at, at one point considered myself a, a white hat um, in, in my network admin job. And I, I don't know, Nate, you have uh, folks over there at tech that I'd like to tinker with this stuff too? Yeah, we have folks that are capable of, of this kind of stuff, but we typically end up not getting really involved. The only time we get involved in this is if uh, sometimes a customer tells us uh, that they've lost their password or someone else has, uh, you know, uh, hijacked their information. We've had to do some ethical hacking to, to break into things, but uh, but yeah, a little bit of this, not much. Sure. And then, um, <clears throat> then we've got gray hat hackers, and, and kind of as the name implies, they fall somewhere between black and white. They They might act illegally, but but justify it in saying, you know, it was in goodwill to, to find some sort of uh, vulnerability that they feel they need to protect people from. Usually don't hack with uh, the intent to steal, uh, you know, money or, or personal information for personal gain. Uh, however, they might, not, they might not tell a vendor that they found um, uh, some sort of exploit or vulnerability. They may just, may just keep it to themselves. So hence the name Gray Hat Hacker. So what do they want? Um, really, it, it could be a little bit of everything. I mean, we've heard cases where, uh, where companies hire hackers to attack the competition, um, or they may be out uh, just for fun. There's, there's many hacking groups that they do it for bragging rights, so they can tell other hacking groups you know, how great they are. They just boast about it. They're not really out to, to hurt anybody or, or uh, you know, cause uh, financial loss or the loss of personal data. Um, but one of the huge motivators is is is, is money. You know, if, if they can get into your uh, company, into your bank account, you know, to uh, fill their pockets, they certainly will. So, big question uh, we could ask a lot. 
you know, how do I know a hacker is in my network? Are they are they here right now, and what are they doing? Um, that the answer to that is is, is a huge maybe. And I wanted to give you a, an example um, of something we ran into here at FR Secure just a few months ago. Um, this is a screenshot of uh, uh, of an antivirus that has been triggered. Um, this this company had several of their servers all at once pop up a, a message similar to this, um, showing that the machine was kicking off a full antivirus scan. And uh, they thought at first maybe it was just some traditional malware. But if you look carefully at some of these uh, and, uh, and look up some of these executable names, these are files that are typically used to uh, hack databases. So your organization might use an Active Directory database. That's like the big database that everybody logs into. Um, you know, in the morning they log in with their user password or log into their email account with those credentials. And these utilities are, are designed to, to break into those and, and reveal those usernames and passwords. So they had us out to, to basically do a breach incident uh, response. And um, unfortunately, the, the uh, you know, knowing if hackers are in your, on your, in your network really is, is a separate, I don't want to get too far into a, into a technical rat hole, but I did want to, to emphasize that, that uh, a big thing you should think about that this organization didn't, unfortunately, is that you really need the logging and alerting infrastructure in place to to be able to go back, you know, two weeks, two months, two years, maybe even in time, if you have an incident where you think you have been breached. Um, because in this case, some hackers from Amsterdam were able to uh, break into this company's terminal servers and then download those those executables I showed you in that screenshot and start attacking um, th this, this business. Um, and, uh, and we started going through all the logs and the servers and, and, and the different network equipment. But unfortunately, it was all, all that equipment was just set to retain logs where the defaults were. So in some cases, maybe a, a network switch or a firewall would only hold on to data you know, for a, a day or maybe even less. You know, the servers had a little bit more information on it. But uh, one of the first things they, they did when they saw they were breached is they unplugged the internet connection, which really was, was smart on their part in that they didn't want, if somebody was, was breaking in and trying to pull data out of the network, you know, they wanted to, to, to cut that off right away. And that was a smart move. But the bad part is they had no long-term logging on well, and, and plugging it back in. We were starting from square one. We, no logs to show who might have been, what their IP address was, uh, those sorts of things. So, to, and then to make matters worse for the, this company, they had an uh, electronic health record program um, that held no logs whatsoever as far as who logged in, what patient data was that access, and that kind of thing. So, we really had a whole lot of nothing. And unfortunately, in that case, if you if you can't prove that you weren't breached and that and that patient personal data, you know, names, address, phone numbers, social security number, all that kind of stuff. If you prove that that wasn't leaked out of the network and that you weren't breached, we have to operate on the assumption that that you were indeed breached. So it's, it, it's kind of hey, scary. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Before you move on, there was a question that came through. Um, there's a couple things that uh, came to mind from myself as well, um, and and, and uh, I would say that we can answer this to the point where it's not going to too much granularity and we can take more detail offline if need be. Um, but uh, one of the questions came in is, um, what are best practices for collecting logs in a centralized location, um, especially when you're working with multiple vendors? Um, and I would add to that is if a hacker is coming in and they're smart enough to hack in, are they smart enough to cover their tracks and try and delete some of these logs? Just curious, uh, your, your some, some thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, that's two two really good really good questions are really good good points. Um, and, and that's you know that's why I said I, I was hoping not to go uh, too from the tech side of things, but but you bring up a great point, which is um, you know what, what we recommend with um, as far as logging products and I think and even clients out there that um, logging mothership, so to speak, that um, can receive and decipher logs from you know, just anything. So, so network switches, servers, workstations, firewalls. And then um, when, when, you know, when we're recommending settings like that up, we would do a design where that um, all the logging uh, uh, traffic and the logging server is on an isolated uh, subnet that 
you know, the, the log data can travel to and be saved at, but cannot otherwise be accessed. You can't just put into that server and start clearing off the logs because that's that's a perfect point in, in that the real good hackers, um, if they're in sniffing around in your network, they are absolutely going to delete logs and just try to cover up their trails on the way out. So, um, so yeah, again, I wanted to stress the importance of the, the logging and alerting, but um, but going on that venture to really set it up and do it right is is uh, definitely takes quite a bit of time and planning. All right, thanks. Uh, so, how do you, how do you protect yourself? Is the answer uh, you know a bigger firewall, um, better and bigger locks in the door? Uh, those those kind of things do all help. But what I wanted to kind of get you guys in the in the mindset of is, you know, what if hackers just start going around the network? instead of trying to uh, attack head on, like the example I just gave you. I wanted to give an example, uh, a, another example from our company where um, uh, Evan, who's our, our president, he was doing a, a social engineering exercise where uh, he dressed up like uh, somebody from the power company and uh, went into to a company and talked to you know, the front desk person, I think it was, and said, hi, I'm the, the power company, we're getting some irregular uh, you know, voltages, spikes, whatever, from your server room, and I really want to go down there and kind of check some things out so that you guys, I don't want you to lose power to that room and, and have everything go down. And so they, you know, took a look at his paperwork and, and walked him down there and kind of held the door open while he went inside and and did, uh, you know, power company guy kind of things. And uh, finally the, the person, the, the employee sitting there in the door just said, Okay, well, you know, my office is right down there around the corner, so just if you need anything, uh, you know, holler. And they shut the door and they left him alone. And so he uh, was able to just turn around and, and plug in a wireless hotspot to the network and leave, get up to his car, and uh, and had wide open access to, to, to the entire network, all without really any, you know, technical hacking skill. I mean, just, just the, the cost and time to get himself a, uh, a power guy, you know, uniform and some, some tools and paperwork and that kind of thing, and, and that was it. It was just really all over in, in a few minutes. So it's just some things to think about, you know, as, as you're getting in the information security mindset is, is kind of having a heightened awareness of what you're seeing around you, you know. I just wrote just because it walks like a duck because, you know, um, Personally, and, and I'll admit, you know, if, I, if, that, if that would have been me, I probably would have just let the power guy, I mean, would have let the power guy in without, uh, um, w without a whole lot of thought. Now, having worked, now that I work here, of course, I, I'm paranoid of, of everything, and I don't let my wife even in the house without showing me some things, but that's a, that's, a separate, that's a separate matter. And I wrote that Minnesota Nice isn't always a, a, a good thing, just in the sense of if we're going to uh, really, really focus on information security, um, we might need to start the questioning things a little bit more, not just take them as value. Um, well, that, as a side note, there, uh, real yeah. quick, Brian, it's just there's a thought. I know one of the people don't. Some of the times when I'm talking to customers, they um, having it's one of the reasons why we're so concerned about having proper security on their wireless solution because now this person in your example walked in to put in an insecure wireless device that they had access to, but Oftentimes, customers may be doing this because their wireless is insecure in the first place, and so someone could just be sitting out in the parking lot doing this kind of thing. So that's that's one of the one of the easiest ways, um, without having to even do any hacking that much, that you could actually gain access to a network. Yeah, yeah, that's <clears throat> that's a great point too. You know, when we yeah when we we do assessments for if the wireless access point is um, older encryption, I mean, uh, you know, with the right tools, you can. You, you can break that in a matter of minutes and, and show the, you know, show the company right there, you know, the importance of properly secured uh, wireless. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, so for, for better or for worse, people are the biggest risk in an organization. Um, why? Because as the last example showed, it's often easier to go to the desk or admin person and go right through them than it is to go through your firewall. And uh, and also social social engineering has shown uh, uh, success rates more than eight times. Uh, you know, a technology based attack. Uh, we're we're getting requests more and more to to uh, run companies through some sort of social engineering exercise to see how employees would hold up against 
you know, uh, a phishing email or uh, you know a call saying, "Oh, hey, I'm from uh, you know I'm from your IT department. I need to just have remote control of your machine briefly so I can check over a couple things." Um, that's actually a, the next example I wanted to show. This is um, this is an email we received from a customer who uh, one of their employees received a call from somebody claiming to be from the company's uh, tech support department, and uh, so they provided the employee with a, a link that that was going to allow uh, the caller to remote control the computer and really do anything they wanted. Um, fortunately, in this case, the the you know the caller had a, a kind of heightened awareness of these sorts of, of, of calls and, and didn't allow the software to execute. But um, but if you think about it, that's a pretty uh, a pretty simple. Call. You know, if we did a little bit of research against the company, we could probably find out who their IT vendor was, and if we called you know a front desk person or anybody out of the blue and said, oh, I'm, you know, so-and-so from such a IT firm, I uh, just need to, you know, install some updates or do some uh, maintenance on your machine. Uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people uh, really question that. They just let it, let it happen. Um, so things to think about, you know, how, how are your, do your users have uh, that kind of training and awareness to, to, to spot those kind of tech support calls? Um, you know, have they been trained against being suspicious of phishing emails? Any any information that kind of thing. Uh, just got one more one more example here, and again, this this came from uh, Evan, our our president. He was doing a uh, uh, dumpster diving uh, a client, and had you know kind of one of those sort of get out of jail free. Um, documents. Please showed up and asked, you know, what he was doing, and he provided the the documentation. But uh, it's my understanding that the documentation had our office phone number on it. So the cops called us asking if Evan was okay to be <laughs> diving in this company's dumpster. And the person who answered here said, "Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. Yep, he's he's got to be okay to to dive in our dumpsters." And and then sort of a little bit of a joke said, "Yeah, you know, you think you could could maybe give him a hand?" And, uh, and, the, and the police said, "Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll we'll give him a hand." And that was the end of the call. And <laughs> they started helping him with his sort of a, with a twist, I guess. But again, it's it's that it, these are all, all things to, to think about, and not things that and, and be a little bit a little bit conscious, maybe even a little bit paranoid about, uh, about what's going on in your organization. And it and it kind of segues into uh, about you know how are you handling information? Not just typically things that would go, you know, in cash, but you know how are you handling data that would come in and out of through, you know, smartphones and tablets, um, USB drives, that sort of thing. That a little bit too. Um, so we'll start. We'll start with a, a, a quiz to kick things off. Uh, lost or stolen mobile devices, uh, such as phones, laptops, thumb drives, and tablets, accounted for how many? Oh, of course, my screen is uh, blocked here. Oops. Get back into it. How many sensitive records compromised in 2012 in the U.S.? Do you have any guesses? Can just a couple people maybe punch the number in the uh, in the chat window? And maybe you'll have to tell me, native. If you see the answers, I don't think I see that question panel you were talking about. Yeah, went up. So, folks, just uh, throw a couple, throw some wild guesses out there. See what we got here. All right, we got uh, a couple coming through here. We got uh, um, some percentages. Uh, we got some fifteen thousand. We've got eighty percent. Uh, you have twenty five thousand. So what what uh, where are we at there? Here's where we're at. Uh, pretty yeah, pretty big big number, and that's of course a anything and everything as far as data. So thank and you. So this is all from handheld like uh, or just mobile devices like smartphones and and ta and laptops and things like that. Is that what this number amounts to? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And, um, Are those the number of devices that were actually stolen or lost, or is that the information that was collected off of those devices? 
Um, I mean, yeah, so I, I think they're kind of number of sensitive, sensitive records compromised. Numbers, I see. Sensitive records, yep. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. And and from from recent past, kind of the probably the the flagship example in, in a negative way was a laptop stolen um, from an employee um, uh, from a, a fair, Fairview Health Services collections vendor. Uh, the laptop was just sitting in a in a car in Minneapolis in a parking lot. Uh, it was not encrypted and contained roughly 14,000 private records. And you know that's everything. That's the real sensitive stuff. You know, patient diagnosis, social security numbers, names, addresses, date of birth, all that kind of stuff. Um, and and the you know the fallout and the penalty for them was was pretty severe. So they had to send a letter to all 14,000 patients. Uh, got sued for 2.5 million. Uh, CEO didn't have a contract they need. And, and you know, as far as the company's perspective, possibly the worst thing was, was just the, the public's perception being, you know, twisted and, and negative now regarding, you know, everybody, when we talk to companies, we, we talk about, you know, the, the loss of data, you know, from laptops and that kind of stuff. They all seem to, to know this this story or this example. Um, and, and it's always, I, I think for me personally, the, the scary thing whenever you hear about these is that it's, the numbers accompanied by, you know, so and so records, or so many, uh, so it's a certain amount of people, um, you know, just that we know of our victims. So fourteen thousand is the number that's that uh, they came up with, but yeah, it, it could be many more. So it's good to think about what what a breach like that would cost your company. Um, I wanted to talk about encryption just briefly because uh, in that case of that Fairview laptop. Um, they would have had a much a much better time managing that um, that loss of data had they had encryption on their laptops. Um, it's it, it's something that's not incredibly expensive or hard to implement. Um, it, it, you do need policy and planning behind it, um, so you know it's not just as easy as downloading a program and running it and you're done. Um, but uh, in the case of Windows 7 and Windows 8, it's it's built in. They have built BitLocker. Uh, that, that's that's what we use here, and it's uh, you know it's good peace of mind knowing that if we ever had a Fairview like situation, um, our data is not walking out the door. You know, the laptop is essentially useless. So all that's on that is, is really if you were to look at the data, it's just it's just noise, just just gibberish. Um, also good to think about USB drives. Um, uh, this is a, a picture of Edward Snowden who you may have heard about uh, um, who leaked uh, some very important NSA information about their surveillance methods. Um, it uh, uh, the articles say that a lot of it that he gathered was just from a USB drive, which which the NSA had banned across the organization. But uh, still, he was able to, to to sneak out. And I don't think he did it in full drives of uh, donuts on them. But I just thought that's just what came up in Google search, and I just found it was amusing. So please don't go to somebody and say, "Oh, did you hear that he snuck it out?" On USB donut flash drives, because I'm, I'm not backing that. That's just my own creative twist on the situation. Um, but something to think about: Does your company? Do you, are, are you currently uh, thinking about USB drive management, and you know whether to allow USB drives or not, or how you're going to manage them? I think um, the main message is there. There's not an easy button to this stuff. Uh, even if you went. Let's say you didn't use uh, in encryption and, and you had no, no mobile device management, nothing like that in place today. You would, if you went today and put encryption on all your laptops and uh, taught taught all your users how to how to spot a social engineering attack or or sniff out a phishing email, that's all great. But it's 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 all part of what needs to be a, a larger business issue. Um, this is this is not something that's IT's problem. This is something the entire organization needs to get behind and and build. Policy and procedure and and governance behind if, it, if it's going to work, and it's also not a not a one size fits all um, solution. So what what works for one one company or one industry, um, it, it's not going to work for everybody else. Um, again, it starts from 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 the top down and having a company you know build an information security policy uh, that would in, include things like how we're going to handle encryption on our devices. Um, how are we going to handle BYOD? You know, people bringing in their or their laptops and tablets and phones from home. You know, are you going to allow them to uh, sync up with company email or download company files to those devices? Um, and what happens if those devices get get 
lost or stolen, what's the, the process for that? Um, you know, a lot of companies we walk into are just, they, they just don't have this in, in, in place yet. Um, and, their, uh, and their users are not, not adequate, adequately trained to, you know, engage in good information security practices. Um, that's, I think, the main, main messages I wanted to, to share, the main things I wanted to talk about. Um, are there other questions and comments from um, anybody on the... Yeah, Brian, I've got, I've got a couple here that have, that have come through. <coughs> um, uh, one of them is with regard to, um, you know, part of what you were just talking about is training and awareness, and I know some of uh, like PCI, uh, payment card industry, credit card compliance, um, they talk about uh, a, a refresher or a regular schedule of training and updating awareness because as staff change, as policies and procedures change, it's not just a once and done kind of uh, uh, engagement uh, when you're talking with your staff and making sure they're up to speed. What are, I mean, what are some of the things that you found or recommend or best practices in that regard to help an organization keep their staff kind of up to date on, on, on those kind of details? I, I think one of the, the, the biggest things that helps is that um, is not to go into with with the idea of you know I'm going to meet my employees uh, every quarter and when we when we meet to talk about information security we're going to talk about every, you know every topic under the sun and they're going to leave as you know uh, information security gurus. I would say that that if you meet you know whatever you meet you know monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, whatever. Just pick pick one topic at a time and really focus on that. So so do you know do a, a lunch and learn kind of thing on how to pick good passwords and and you know try to make it fun, try to make it entertaining because a lot of people are just you know resistant to that. They want to be able to use password one two three as their password and they want to stick it on a big sticky note and have it right there on their monitor. Um, there's there's a, there's a lot to cover in just the just some of the, the basic security principles. And so I think the important thing is to, to not overwhelm people and just kind of take it, uh, take it in baby steps, you know, take it one, one phase at a time. Um, and then I think you'll find people will be more on board uh, with supporting the, the information security program. Well, that sounds great. What, one of the other things I, I think I've, I understand uh, our customers have struggled with and I imagine is uh, challenging is is just even taking and writing policy, right? I mean, the the it's great to talk about in theory. It's it's easy to you know explain, but you know, uh, is there? Uh, I mean, is that something that uh, you guys recommend? Is that an internal resource typically that should write that policy? Is it you know grab some boilerplate stuff online and then maybe make some edits to it? I mean, how how have you seen companies handle the documentation of the actual? policy components of, of this to help, you know, reinforce, especially those that are in a regulated industry, right? If you're, you know, dealing with, you know, the, the healthcare or credit card compliance or financial and, and, and uh, those kind of things. What, what have you seen there? Yeah, you know, actually it's funny. We, we've seen a, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of copy, you know, copying right from, from Google where, where people will take policies and, and procedures and then they'll just substitute, you know, company name X for their company name and kind of say, yeah, you know, this this is us. I think we're I think we're done here. <laughs> and and uh, um, you know, as far as to you know, if somebody internally can can write those policies, certainly I, I, that's a uh, something I think that that can be done with some some time. But usually we, we like to to start and really get to know an organization. And start start small start by writing just a few policies that you know that fit the organization that the that the organization has actually discussed with. Uh, you know, with with, with the, the senior executives, you know, so that, that again, it's a it, it's a um, it's a collaborative effort as a as a business, not just IT or a couple people going. Well, what's our policy on um, backup retention or on uh, encryption? You know, well, I guess it's it's this. You know, um, so I would say um, again um, to to start start small, kind of start one one policy at a time, and, and it has to fit your business, not not a um, not a, a business that. <laughs> you found on Google, right? No, that's good. I, I appreciate that. That's definitely making sure that those things are in alignment with the organizational goals and objectives, and that those who are, I mean, to the end, it's it's going to be the leadership and ownership of an organization that's going to be on the hook. Yeah, again, something like this happens, right? So they need to be involved in the in in, in where the protections need to to uh, 
um, be in place. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's exactly right. And, and um, uh, kind of what you alluded to is that, yeah, that, I mean, the policies need to make sense. They need to be written in, in a language that people can follow. And then they also need to, to be um, reviewed. That's another big thing we see is that, um, you know, here's the, the company's information security policy or their policy on acceptable, uh, you know, website viewing use. And it was written, you know, uh, 10 years ago by an IT person that's not here anymore, and two-thirds of the content is irrelevant. I mean, that's that's the other thing we see is that people have read the right intentions, they have a good start, but um, but the policies are collecting dust. So along those lines, um, uh, you know, I, I've got another question to, to follow up that uh, hasn't come through um, from the audience, but I know that uh, people think about it. So I'll, I'll pause that as kind of a, a finale. Um, however, if you were to give some, you know, in, in all your interaction with, you know, different organizations, um, where do you see, and I, I know, I'm sure your presentation probably touched on it, but where do you see probably the biggest risk? And if, if a company was going to pick the first thing to try and dig into, the, the, the one major area that they should really focus their attention first and foremost um, with, within their organization, what should they look at first? What, what should be their first step? Yeah, like kind of if they were just looking for just one place to at least, you know, without a ton of time and effort, kind of get 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 in better shape. I would we do a lot of a lot of uh, internal and external assessments. So we we you know we'll we'll come into a network and we'll scan um, the network to see you know what's what's the patch level, uh, what it, you know uh, what kind of applications are out there and, and are they getting kind of their their proper care and feeding, so to speak, you know, are being patched on a regular level. And um, I, what we find in just about every case is that, um, is that there's, not, there's not good patch management in, in place. It's either in place but not, you know, not scheduled, not taken care of on, on a regular basis. Like there's not really a methodology or um, a, a lot of thought into, um, uh, you know, the patch kind of um, or we'll see that you know, hey, on on kind of the system side of things, the operating system levels are, you know, patching, but it's third-party applications that are you know, behind. So you know, your the, the Java, the Adobe products, um, Flash, those kind of things, um, all which have huge vulnerabilities and can be a pain to patch because at least one of those programs probably comes out with a a, a fix to an exploit. You know, every 23 minutes, you know, but, but we find that that companies just they don't have um, a, a system in place to get the, the third party uh, uh, products up to date. So I, I would that that's one place that 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 you could start with, and there's definitely you know tons of solutions out there, um, you know, third party products and, and such that will make your life a lot a lot easier in the in the patch management department, and you know, give you reports. You know, here's some machines that just haven't been been touched and need some uh, some PLC, uh, so I would, I you know, I, I would start there. So usually, so the biggest like you know uh, area is is really just on the technology front, just making sure things are. And I guess that's what I was wondering. I didn't know if it was on a is it on the education of your staff? Is it on you know what should should they focus on making sure their firewall is current or their patches are up to date? Like because it's a multifaceted piece, and but you feel that the initial place to go from the biggest bang for your buck, and you know probably the, the you know, greatest potential for exploit or whatever is just really digging in there. Is that kind of what you're alluding to as far as digging in? Yeah, it's kind of a tough question because you know, like I was saying in the in the presentation, it's like if you if you take you know different things, just isolated areas of improvement, um, you know, you, you you kind of miss the overall point, which again is, is to have the whole business behind you and, and really tackle um, information security as a as a as a business issue that affects all areas of the business again, not just just IT. Um, but but we do get asked a lot. Well, okay, gosh, I've got all these things to do. Um, our you know our our net assessment shows that we're in really rough shape. I just I need to. Um, I I you know, to patch management and and also yeah user training and it's it's tough because it's all it's all important and it all fits together, but. Um, without uh, uh, without a lot of uh, effort and expense, um, uh, you can get get your at least your internal network, you know, and, and in a more healthy state, so that it's 
less vulnerable to, to exploits and, and hackers. Perfect. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah, it's kind of protect the foundation from which you can build upon. So, um, so okay, so now the finale question that uh, has been, if it's not on top of people's minds, uh, I know some people it is, uh, is that so Microsoft, you know, can you shed some light on um, topics like, you know, um, ma firewall manufacturers uh, will end of life products and say, hey, uh, this product, I mean, well, I can go in the back room and the lights are still blinking, but the manufacturers tell me that I shouldn't, you know, that th this product should be end of life and you should replace it. Um, but yet I'm sitting here looking at the lights and it looks fine. Uh, or I'm running, uh, Microsoft has announced uh, many products are end of life uh, as of April of next year. XP, for example, some Windows products, server products, um, you know, but it still runs. Why, why should I, you know, why should I replace that? Can you shed some light on just the general kind of approach of, of what's going on and, and, and why is there a end of life cycle when, when, you know, when you come to a hardware or software manufacturer perspective? Yeah, well, and and this is certainly something we run into uh, a lot too, where people have uh, you know either yeah operating systems or hardware that has has uh, you know uh, been end of life, and uh, you know the big concern there is when when software or hardware um, when, you know once it hits end of, of life, the big worry for for us and our customers is <clears throat> is a man has a manufacturer also discontinued um, updates for these products. That's the you know that's the big thing that I. I think causes stress for for us and our customers is that they don't want to be number one they don't want to be running something that um, is no longer getting updated particularly if there are key security fixes that you know some big vulnerability that's uh, publicized and you find out oh my my operating system or my device just isn't going to get it because it's uh, it's, it's too old um, you know that's a big reason to make sure that all of your uh, your systems are on a on a current life cycle and with a, a current support contract, um, and support is the other uh, is, is the other big one. I mean, uh, you know, we've been in in, in networks where they have uh, uh, servers and switches, everything that has you know got a, a four hour turnaround. You know, if anything goes down, the hardware vendor will be right out there to replace it. But then their you know their main firewall is uh, uh, is end of life and um, you know has no support contract on it and um, is running a software uh, or a firmware version that's two years old and now they're you know in that case they've they're, they're kind of doubly out of luck because um, that thing goes down and they're going to be scrambling to bring their business back online um, and in the meantime the firewall may be just sitting out there uh, vulnerable to all sorts of new attacks uh, and just be a, a sitting duck yeah, the other thing that I guess um, I don't know if it's a, it's a final comment, maybe I know that um, what I've you know things I've experienced, or and I'm wondering if you have too, is that you know as technology evolves and hackers evolve with it, and it's kind of a cat and mouse game, um, that you know equipment or software that was manufactured you know six, seven, ten, twelve years ago just doesn't you know when it was made it it, it had no idea of the hacking techniques that exist today. And what's going to exist tomorrow? So, you know, so it's at some point it's just not able to keep up with the protection with the current like wireless security is an example of that, right? Old school wireless security, it's been demonstrated to be hacked. Uh, so, so now the old security, what we used to consider secure, is no longer because new hacking techniques have made that obsolete. Um, are, are you seeing that happening as well? Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I think your point raises another. Uh, uh, concern in that, uh, as far as with the evolution of, of attacks and, and vulnerabilities, is that um, uh, we're finding too that that uh, just kind of back on the, the whole patch management and, and keeping your you know devices up to date is that uh, kind of the oft overlooked things are um, you know include printers and other you know web-based devices that are sitting on your network that also may need um, uh, you know may have published uh, attacks and vulnerabilities that that they need to be patched against. Uh, as well, so um, so yeah, no, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. Hit it, hit it on the head that uh, um, you you can't take uh, too lightly those sort of things, and I think that all emphasizes that you know you should be running current gen hardware and software, um, you know, to provide the best uh, protection you can against uh, against vulnerabilities and, and the bad guys. Well, uh, thanks for that, Brian. I, um 
we are now at the end of our 45 minutes. And to be respectful of everyone's time, I want to say uh, thanks for participating, those online, uh, and uh, well, as well as those who will be watching this uh, in the future. We do record this, and it will be on our website here shortly. And so if there's anyone in your organization that you feel that could benefit from this, there will be links. Uh, they'll, they'll, it's right on our website. You'll be able to view this. Um, but thank you very much, Brian, for taking the time, and FR Secure for investing in some educational content for folks. And uh, um, let us know how we can help. And if those of you who we didn't get to some of your questions online, we will follow up with you afterwards uh, and make sure we address your questions offline. So thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, signing off. And thanks a lot, Brian, again, for your time. Thanks a lot. Yeah, have a great day, everybody. That was fun. Great. Thank you.